This is a production of Cornell University. Okay. All right, if there are no announcements, um, let's get started. My name is Adam Bogdanov. I'm the doctoral advisor of today's seminar speaker. It's my great pleasure to introduce her, Morgan Carter. Morgan is a native of North Carolina. She came to Cornell after earning her bachelor's degree from NC State, and that was in biochemistry with minors in genetics and biotechnology. As an undergraduate, Morgan was active in research, as you might have guessed. And while in Margaret Dobbs' lab at NC State, she contributed to the discovery that polyketide, polyketide synthesis is associated with sexual reproduction in Pseudocercospora fijiensis, which is the fungus that causes the devastating disease of banana called black cigatoka disease. Um, on admission to Cornell, uh, Morgan was awarded a Presidential Life Sciences Fellowship, which allowed her to do rot rotations. And I was very fortunate that she chose my lab for one of her three rotations. And uh, more fortunate, I think, that she was drawn to a particular project we had ongoing at the time to identify and characterize effector proteins of the barley powdery mildew pathogen using bacterial deliver of those candidate effectors. So as Morgan will describe to you today, while gearing up for the sort of the next stage in that project, um, her attempts to reproduce some data we had just published before she joined the lab led to the realization that those published experiments were flawed. They had been confounded by an effect of bacterial titer that we hadn't accounted for. So we retracted the paper and Morgan published her first paper then from Cornell, which was a letter to the editor explaining her findings and showing the world basically how to do bacterial delivery assays correctly. So um, Morgan having established that bacterial delivery assay for, for barley, um, that led to a uh, next to a very productive collaboration with Roger Innes's lab at Indiana University and Roger Wise's lab at Iowa State. And this study identified, well, it, it leveraged discoveries by the Innes lab in the model plant Arabidopsis to identify and characterize a new and potentially engineerable source of resistance in barley and in wheat. That work led to her second paper published in NPMI. And that was uh, co-first authored with Matt Helm from Roger Innes's lab. And that's something she'll also tell you about today. So I guess by this time, Morgan had acquired uh, an affinity for translating knowledge from model systems to discovery in non-model and often really challenging systems. Um, and so we were fortunate again that she sort of took the reins on a project that had been stymieing many of us up to that point, a new project, to figure out what uh, tal effector-like proteins in a bacterial endosymbiont of an agriculturally important fungus uh, might be doing. And this has been a collaboration with Teresa Pavlovska's lab and led to Morgan's third paper, uh, which we just heard yesterday. It's okay to say this, Morgan? Yeah, has been accepted at PNAS, uh, pending minor revision, so that's really good news. Uh, and if I top, so top, stop talking soon enough, Morgan will be able to tell you that story as well. Uh, just one more thing though, uh, Morgan is not only a terrific scientist, she's shown tremendous leadership as a graduate student. I just wanted to to share that with you here and, and recognize her for that. As president of the Graduate Student Association for, for PPBMB, she successfully advocated for student representation on faculty search committees. She served as our first graduate student rep in that capacity and now it's not, that's our, our, our regular practice now. She also helped create the SIPS-wide, the school-wide Graduate Student Association. She's advocated for sound science policy as a member of the APS Public uh, Policy Board. She's been on the Hill a number of times in that capacity. She regularly interacts with students around the country through Skype a scientist interviews. If you guys haven't done Skype a scientist, um, Morgan can tell you all about that. It's really rewarding. Uh, she's a great mentor. Two of her undergraduate mentees have been co-authors on her papers. Uh, and she's also a prolific and very popular tweeter. Uh, if you don't know at Plant Path Secret, where have you been? If you don't follow at Plant Path Secret, you should. And uh, I think I'll stop there and then we'll switch screens here and hand it over to Morgan for her presentation. Thank you all for coming. Okay, uh, hi everybody. Thank you, Adam, for the introduction. Uh, so welcome to my virtual exit seminar here. I'm thankful you're joining me today. If you haven't used Zoom before, the most important thing is going to be to just keep your microphone muted so that um you're not distracting to anybody else so uh please do so um and also you're welcome to keep your video off if that's helping your connectivity 
There's also a chat button that we can use at the very end um, so that uh, you can ask questions and help us know that you want to ask questions. So uh, with that, we'll get started. So the title of my seminar today is um, actually the title of my thesis, which is Translating Lessons from Effector Biology to Fungal Effector Screens, uh, Plant Resistance Mechanisms, and Bacterial Fungal Interactions. And this is a rather broad, long title with a lot of jargony words in it. But if we kind of break it down visually, my main goal has been to take things that we already know about um, plant pathogens and how bacteria communicate with their hosts that we've learned in model systems and take all those lessons and put them into systems that we don't know much about or have a hard time studying or to be able to just fast track discovery of entirely new things. I'm gonna try to see if I can get rid of this bar here, but it doesn't seem to want to go away. So that's okay, I designed my science slide for this. So first I'm gonna to talk to you about um, effector biology, just so that we're all on the same page of what I mean when I'm kind of saying the word effector. So bacteria and other microbes have to interact with their environments, and they do so using a variety of secretion systems. The top image is showing you a bunch of different secretion systems that are used by bacteria to move molecules from inside of their cells out into their environment or into hosts. When we're talking about uh, plant pathogens, especially gram-negative bacterial plant pathogens, one of the main secretion systems we focus on is a type three secretion system. And this is shown in the bottom image and can be thought of as a molecular syringe that moves proteins from the inside of the bacterial cell, through the bacterial cell wall, through the plant cell wall, and into the plant cell. So it's able to move something that the bacteria has made directly into a host where it can carry out some role that's gonna help out the bacterium. The type three secretion system is important not only for plant pathogens, but also animal pathogens and plant symbionts as well. So it's been very well studied, and we know a lot about the structure of this system, as well as the different effector proteins that are used uh, by some of the bacteria. During plant infection, uh, if we think about this kind of a model of how plants infect, uh, or how pathogens affect plants, I've shown here a very simplified diagram, just to get the basics down, of the model plant pathogen Pseudomonas uh, infecting the model plant Arabidopsis thaliana. The first thing is that the bacteria are going to invade the plant and there they can be detected by receptors that bind microbial molecular patterns, causing a pattern triggered immunity. So basically the plant is able to detect a single bit of bacterium, for instance, a piece of the flagella, and decide this is not a plant protein, this is non-self, and um, that's going to allow the plant to say, okay, sound the alarms, we've got to put up our first defense response. And this is kind of a lesser defense response that'll stop your general infection. The bacteria then can secrete effector proteins to shut down the defense response and promote infection. And this allows the bacteria to actually win because some of these effectors are going to go in and mess with those proteins that were um, mediating pattern triggered immunity. So you have effectors actually stopping that PTI. The plant can then use intracellular proteins to detect these effectors or their activity and trigger effector triggered immunity. This is a larger defense response. It's actually a programmed cell death um, causing a hypersensitive reaction. And this can be visible if you infiltrate a lot of a bacterium into a plant uh, that's going to cause an HR. You can actually see a large cell death, a big brown spot on the plant. So all of this in this slide is very simplified. But there are tons and tons of proteins um, and signaling components going on with each of these parts of this uh, interaction. And these have been very well studied, especially in model, model pathosystems like Arabidopsis and Pseudomonas. But what if you get outside of a model pathosystem or into something that just has a lot more to deal with? For instance, with fungi, they have hundreds of potential effector candidates compared to bacteria that are in more in the tens. Some fungi are obligate biotrophs and cannot be genetically manipulated. Um, and we don't really know as much about fungal secretion. So it makes it a little bit harder to study their effectors from that angle as well. So there's a push to use what we know about bacteria to screen fungal candidate effectors. And to do this, you just need a bacterium with a known response on your plant of interest. So in our case, we were working in barley. So if you have a bacterium that doesn't cause that hypersensitive reaction or HR, 
you can give it a candidate fungal effector with the type 3 secretion system tag. So it's able to go through the bacterial secretion and into the host plant. And you can test candidate effectors one by one to see if they're doing anything in the plant cell. The test you may want to do is trying to see if they're able to cause an HR on their own by being detected by the plant, or if they're able to suppress HR that's being caused by um, the other bacterium that can actually cause that. So we can look for effectors that are uh, taking the plant off or calming the plant down. But I found out pretty quickly that you have to be careful which bacterium you use. In that previous study that Adam was mentioning, our lab was using a a pathogen, Xanthomonas campestris rifani, to infiltrate, or we were infiltrating that into barley plants. Now, XCR is not a barley pathogen, but it does have its own suite of effectors, and these can still cause a host response in barley. So while it might have been delivering the fungal effector we were interested in, it was also bringing it a whole thing of a whole bunch of things with it. So I found out that you get this uh, weird response that can be titer dependent and is only in certain barley lines. And that confounded the results of that study leading to a retraction and a publication of a letter to the editor where we advocated for the use of disarmed plant pathogens or things that weren't plant pathogens at all so that you could have a, a more controlled delivery of the, your fungal effector. So what we were advocating for um, and what we began using is the Colmer Labs development of a Pseudomonas syringae polymutant. And so this is an actual plant pathogen where all of its effectors have been removed. And so it serves as a good kind of empty syringe for being able to give exactly what you want to inject into the host plant. So we did this for a little bit looking at fungal effectors, but we really weren't coming up with much as we were going through um, some powdery mildew effectors. So we turned our attention to using the same kind of a uh, single effector study mechanism to be able to uh, look at plant resistance mechanisms instead and try to think about the ones that we already knew about from the model plant Arabidopsis and determine if those were present in other host plants. So the mechanism that we are interested in is uh, how AVR PPHB is detected in Arabidopsis. Now AVR PPHB is an effector protease that's secreted by Pseudomonas bacteria and once inside of the host cell, it uh, localizes to the plasma membrane where it um, interacts with different kinases and actually cuts them up. And the kinases that it's interacting with um, are members of a large family conserved in all flowering plants. And some members of this family are actually involved in pattern triggered immunity. So this effector is trying to shut down that first line of plant immunity. Unfortunately for this bacterium, PBS1 is also a member of that family, and it is guarded by RPS5, which is an NLR or R gene. So it's really a decoy kinase that's trying to trap AVR PPHB, because when it's cleaved by AVR PPHB, it causes RPS5 to trigger a hypersensitive reaction or defense response. Now, this has been very well studied in Arabidopsis. We know all the players, and we know all the pieces of this that are important. So why are we still kind of talking about it? Like what else is there to look at? Well, our, the collaborators of our in Roger Ennis's lab discovered that you could actually modify this same mechanism to detect other pathogens based on their proteases. So say you want to make a plant that's resistant to a virus like the tobacco etch virus, which makes its own protease labeled here as TEV. If you take the cut site in PBS1 that's usually targeted by AVR PPHB, and you change that to the tobacco etch virus cut site um, for its protease, you can give that new decoy back to the plant and get the same kind of resistance response, but in this case, it's triggered by the virus instead of by our Pseudomonas bacterium. So we're able to make a whole new resistant plant that's now resistant to a virus using machinery that was already in the plant. This has widespread application because there are many kinds of plant pathogens that create and secrete prote proteases during their infection. So this is all great, but it's all been done in Arabidopsis, and a lot of the function of this would then be in crop plants and things we grow to eat. So that leaves us with the questions of whether or not we can deploy PBS1 mediated immunity in crop plants, and would this require moving all of those proteins that are in Arabidopsis into other plants? 
or are those proteins already in other plants? Um, we just aren't aware of them. So is there endogenous host machinery that's mediating the same interaction? So our objective is to determine if barley responds to AVRPPHB and with the same mechanism as Arabidopsis, with the idea that if this mechanism is there, we can then use it to engineer barley for uh, new resistance. So this is my knowledge recap slide that I'll keep coming back to to help you keep track of which proteins and which questions I'm asking. The first thing that we need to know is whether or not barley responds to ABRPPHB at all. Does it have any kind of defense response that would imply that there are some proteins mediating and surveying and surveilling for ABRPPHB? To answer this question, we can use that Pseudomonas syringae polymutant to deliver ABRPPHB or AVRPPHB C98S, which is a catalytically inactive mutant uh, of that um, effector that does not able to cleave anything. So this allows us to look for barley lines that are responding to AVRPPHB activity, not just presence. We screened 150 lines and found that 65 responded in some way. And this ranged from a hypersensitive reaction with an obvious cell death, all the way down to kind of a low chlorosis that was just a little bit of yellowing. So that's good. That means that barley is responding to AVRPPHB, and that means that there must be proteins involved that are mediating that response. So the first protein that we're going to look for with the idea that it might be involved is PBS1. I mentioned that PBS1 is a member of a very conserved kinase family. So we were not surprised to find that there are two PBS1 homologs present in barley, uh, HV PBS1-1 and 1-2. And these are the closest to the Arabidopsis copy when we look phylogenetically. Both of these have the AVRPPHB cut site, and both of these can be cleaved by AVRPPHB when co-expressed in planta. So that was pretty straightforward and simple. It looks like there are PBS1 kinases in barley that are cleaved by AVRPPHB. So it's possible that those are involved, just like in Arabidopsis, with mediating how this uh, interaction works. However, now comes the hard part, because now we have to find our NLR or R gene, um, our RPS5. Finding the NLR that is responsible for the phenotype you're observing can be a bit like finding a needle in a haystack, because there are hundreds of predicted encoded NLR genes, in, or predicted encoded NLRs in a genome, and it's not necessarily clear from their sequence and phylogenetic analysis of what their function is. So to narrow down where we needed to look for a candidate, we mapped the location of the NLR using a nested association mapping population that was developed by scientists at the University of Minnesota. The way this population is set up is that there's a single common parent called Rasmussen, and this is crossed with um, other barley lines that are of diverse genotypes that are your other parents. The progeny from this cross is then self to create recombinant inbred lines with assayed SNP data. So each of the resulting plants should have about half of its genetic information from Rasmussen and half of it from the other parent. And we have all of that genotype data. We got very lucky in that Rasmussen is actually a responding line for AVRPPHB and responds with an HR. So we just had to look for the parents in the diverse genotypes that did not respond to AVRPPHB and assay the subpopulations for the phenotype of AVRPPHB response. We could then combine that phenotype and genotype data uh, computationally, and the output of that is a Manhattan plot, as shown here. A peak in this plot indicates an area in the genome that is significantly associated with the trait that you are looking at. So in this case, we had a single peak, which is where we assume our NLR gene will be. And when we zoom into that peak on the third chromosome, we find a variety of NLR candidates that are indicated as triangles. So we've now narrowed down from hundreds of NLR genes in the barley genome to about 10 to 20. Fast forwarding a bit through all of those candidates, I'm mostly just going to talk about our favorite candidate that we subsequently named AVRPPHB response 1 or PBR1. PBR1 quickly turned into my favorite candidate because when I looked at PBR1 in the reference genome, it actually looked to be non-functional which doesn't sound like a positive, except that the reference genome corresponds to a barley line that does not respond to AVRPPHB. 
So I'm actually looking for a gene that either isn't in the reference genome or is there in a non-functional copy. When I sequence the allele of PBR1 from Rasmussen, that common parent that did respond to ABRPBHB, I found that there was an intact gene there, that it did look like a full length NLR was encoded at that location. So I had a gene with a predicted functional copy and a barley line that responds to ABRPBHB and a predicted non-functional copy and a line that does not respond to AVRPPHB. So signs were looking good. I next looked at expression and found that PBR1 is expressed across barley lines that respond to AVRPPHB and is not necessarily expressed in those that don't. Also a good sign. When I sequenced the alleles of 12 different barley lines, I found that PBR1 allele sequences uh, clustered out by the phenotypes that we were observing when we challenged the barley with AVRPPHB. So this was a lot of good like correlation with our ABA, our PPHB response and our PBR1 gene information. As we were going along, we decided we need to see if PBR1 was just the copy of RPS5 that was in barley. Had this been conserved as long as barley and Arabidopsis had been branching apart? Um, or was this an entirely different NLR that had um, evolved this ability? So we did phylogenetic analysis of all predicted barley and LR genes and some known Arabidopsis and LR genes and found that PBR1 and RPS5 are not direct orthologs. They're quite far apart um, in terms of just your general NLR genes. But interestingly, we, we did find that a different gene within our um, peak from our uh, genome analysis found uh, that gene does not differ much in sequence or expression between Rasmussen and Morex. Uh, despite the fact that it looked a lot like RPS5. So that allowed us to more confidently focus on PBR1 going forward, uh, because even though it didn't look like RPS5, it had these specific qualities uh, that looked more like what we were expecting from a causal gene. So from there, we moved into functional verification um, and decided to co-express uh, PBR1 and AVRPPHB in planta to see if we could rebuild that response in a different plant. Unfortunately, when we cloned PBR1 from Rasmussen, which is a PBR1B allele, we found that it was incredibly autoactive, which is indicated by the brown on green or teal on red leaves in the bottom image there. This is a problem because we can't really see if uh, PBR1 is interacting with other proteins and causing a cell death, if it's just causing cell death all by itself. But we thought back to the fact that different barley uh, lines were responding to AVRPPHB with different intensities and decided to then clone an allele of PBR1 from a barley line that was just a low chlorosis responder and found that PBR1C, an allele from uh, one of those lines, was actually less autoactive and that allowed us to do co-expression assays. So we co-expressed PBR1C with AVRPPHB in the model plant Nicotiana benthamiana. And we did see an increase in cell death when both of those were present that relied on AVRPPHB activity. This is analogous with what we see when we co-express RPS5 and the Arabidopsis PBS1 with AVRPPHB in the same plant. We verified this by electrolyte leakage assay, but you might be noticing that I'm kind of missing a partner there and that we were only expressing PBR1 and AVRPPHB and we were kind of missing that PBS1 homologue when we were putting it into this other plant where we were trying to rebuild the response. We think that the reason we didn't have to put in another PBS1 during that interaction is because uh, these kinases are conserved in all flowering plants. So Nicotiana benthamiana has a PBS1 homologue, and that is also able to be cleaved by AVRPPHB. So it's possible that PBR1 is a bit of a promiscuous protein, and can uh, associate with PBS1 homologs from different uh, plants, and that'll allow it to mediate the response and detect AVRPPHB activity. But we're still kind of left with that question because we didn't have to do that when we were rebuilding this response in a different plant. So to answer the question of how PBR1 and PBS1 uh, relate to each other with this system, we decided to do a co-immunoprecipitation assay, and we're just going to focus on the right half of this slide and just on a few boxes that I'm going to outline for you. Basically how this works is we are trying to pull down PBR1C and see what comes with it and therefore what was associating with it in planta. 
the blue box with black bars is indicating that we were successfully pulling down PBR1C. And when we did so, the PBS1 homologs from Arabidopsis, barley, and Nicotiana were all able to come down with PBR1C. So we could get uh, this association that PBR1 and PBS1 homologs are forming in planta. This was specific to PBR1. It was not just the result of some kind of cell membrane thing. Uh, because we had a negative control that was also plasma membrane localizing. So that allows us to finish our model, and we can see that PBR1 does appear to associate with PBS1 in planta, so it's likely mediating the uh, interaction by detecting when PBS1 is being cleaved by AVRPPHB. And if we go back to looking at the Arabidopsis mechanism that we had for detecting AVRPPHB, and this new barley mechanism that we've characterized, they do seem very similar. And this is convergent evolution of analogous resistant mechanisms because PBR1 and RPS5 are not direct orthologs and they evolved independently to serve the same role of kinase guarding to detect against defectors that are trying to shut down PTI. So bringing that back to kind of what next in the larger picture, if this PBS1 guarded mechanism is present in barley and Arabidopsis, it's highly likely it is present in other flowering plants. Uh, we know from our own evidence that uh, wheat has a homologue of PBR1, and my co first author, Matt Helm, uh, found, uh, did more work to determine that PBS1 in soybean can be engineered for viral immunity. And the future application of this, as kind of a reminder, is that you can increase disease resistance in barley and other crops by deploying engineered decoys based on protease effectors with known cleavage sites. So you can create these different PBS1 decoys and put them back in your um, plant of interest to create new kinds of pathogen resistance. Now, I need everybody to also take a breath for a second because I'm going to leave this lovely story in a plant behind. And we're going to think about something totally different. Because I had been working so much in bacteria that infect plants and thinking about plant resistance mechanisms and how do effector proteins work and everything in this very specific environment, I kind of got a little bit interested in thinking about what happens if a bacterium lives inside of a fungus instead, especially because we are learning more and more um, as more studies are coming out that many fungi harbor bacteria inside of them. And we really don't know anything about how these interactions are formed and um, whether or not they use effector proteins and things like that. This is a very active um, emerging area of research. So for my final chapter, I started thinking about what if you live in a fungus? And the fungus that I'm interested in is Rhizopus microsporus. It infects rice seedlings and immunocompromised humans. It's also a tempeh fermenter, a bread mold, and a soil saprophyte. So it's kind of a jack of all trades fungus. Some isolates of Rhizopus microsporus harbor endosymbiotic Burkholderia species, which are shown in this micrograph, uh, they are glowing green. In the top left image, you can see green bacteria in a fungal hypha, and in the top right image, there's a bacterium in a spore. Other non-host Rhizopus isolates interact antagonistically with Burkholderia, so it's a very interesting uh, system for looking at what's required to establish and maintain a symbiosis and whether or not you can lose that. This clade of Burkholderia bacteria was recently restructured into a new genus called Mycetohabitans, but I'm going to refer to it just as Burkholderia for this presentation for ease of communication. So what do we know about the Burkholderia rhizopus symbiosis? Well, the bacteria was initially discovered in 2005 because it provides a toxin that's necessary for plant infection. The cured fungus can no longer um, kill rice seedlings. It's not as clear if bacterial presence affects animal infection. We do know that host sporulation requires the bacterial partner, both sexual and asexual. So it seems like the bacterium has taken hold of its fungal host and said, you're not reproducing unless you take me with you. And this implies some amount of coevolution, which is also implied by the fact that the Burkholderia species have partially reduced genomes of about three megabases. They have type 2 and type 3 secretion systems that are both required for the symbiosis. And if you knock either one out, you cannot form that symbiosis. And this micrograph is actually showing you uh, bacteria trying to infect the fungal hyphae by dumping chitinases out of their type 2 secretion system. 
uh, that'll eat up enough of the cell wall for them to kind of melt into the cell. So we know that the type two secretion system is dumping chitinases, but what is the type three secretion system doing? Well, there are no known effector proteins from this uh, or any other bacterial symbionts of fungi, but when the genome came out for this uh, specific bacterium, the type strain Burkleri rhizoxenica, a few people looked at it and went, is that a tal effector? Now to have that thought, you need to know what a tal effector is. Tal stands for transcription activator-like effector, and these are proteins produced by Xanthomonas and Ralstonia species that are plant pathogens. So in this slide, I'm showing you a Xanthomonas bacterium infecting a rice cell. And this is actually the model pathosystem that's most studied in the Bogdanov lab, and is kind of the way that we were introduced to uh, this, this whole project. Tal effectors have a type three secretion system signal, so they're able to be secreted into the plant cell where they use nuclear localization signals to move into the nucleus. There they can bind DNA with a repetitive DNA recognition domain and induce transcription via an activation domain of whatever they're kind of bound in front of. The idea for the bacterium is that uh, these tal effectors will turn on susceptibility genes or S genes. And these are uh, plant genes that in, for some reason make the environment better for bacterial infection. So the bacterium is actually trying to turn them on. And this could be uh, some kinds of transporters that make a more aqueous environment or get nutrients out to the bacterium. Um, it's a very active area of study because of its impact on plant resistance. Tal effectors have also gained a lot of interest from their use as biotechnology. Their repetitive, uh, by, that repetitive central domain that interacts with the DNA um, is very modular and that each repeat binds to a single nucleotide. Each repeat is very well conserved except for two amino acids that form the repeat variable dye residue. And those two amino acids are actually uh, indicate the specificity of that repeat for which uh, DNA nucleotide it will bind to. And we know the code, so you can uh, take the amino acid sequence of a tal effector and know what DNA sequence you will expect it to bind to based on its RVDs. Conversely, you can target any DNA sequence of interest by building your own tal effector, basically like Legos, to target uh, that DNA sequence based on the tal RVDs that you put into your designer tal effector. And this has been used largely in um, gene editing and genetic engineering, as well as you can use it as just a designer transcription factor. When the Berkeley genome came out, it was right at kind of the heyday of biotech use for tal effectors. So the first two papers that started looking at whether or not these endofungal symbionts had tal effectors were only looking at them from really a biotech perspective and whether or not they could bind DNA, um, and whether you could use them to make nucleases and things. But I'm much more interested in this from a like native role of those proteins. What are they really doing in this symbiosis? We're calling them Burkleria tau-like proteins or beetles because they don't look exactly like Xanthomonas taus. They have some key differences. First, they have a cryptic type three secretion signal. So it wasn't necessarily even clear off the bat if they were effector proteins at all, they may not even be secreted. They also have no predicted nuclear localization signal despite the fact that they can bind DNA. Their repeat recognition domain, it has much higher variability even though there are clear RVDs and they do follow the TAL code for how they bind DNA. And they have no activation domain. So it's very unclear as to what they do once they bind DNA. This becomes a big old hypothesis slide and is what I'll keep coming back to in this section of the talk uh, as we dive through each of these kind of components of the beetle protein. Are they expressed during the symbiosis? Are they secreted? Where do they go? And what do they do? First off, we needed to pick a strain to work with. So there were three sequenced rhizopus associated Berkeley area strains uh, when we started off. And one of these, um, B13, actually only has one beetle gene, whereas the other two have three. So we decided to stay working with B13 and the beetle gene that we named beetle 1913 to reduce the potential for redundancy. To determine whether or not beetle genes are being expressed, we 
or I designed a construct that uh, had Beetle 1913 driven by its native promoter and tagged with M Cherry. This will allow the bacteria to fluoresce red or pink when they're expressing Beetle 1913. They will also always show up as yellow or green because of a constitutive YFP that's in the same plasmid. And when I reinfected a uh, rhizopus with bacteria carrying this plasmid and looked inside of a rhizopus hypha, which is uh, the nuclei, nuclei of our um, stained in blue with DAPI for your reference, I found bacteria that were showing up uh, quite bright green as well as bright pink. So it does look like beetle 1913 is expressed endohyphally. So this made me feel like, all right, these are probably not just pseudogenes, they're not just remnants that are weirdly broken in this um, bacterium, they must be doing something. But what are they acting on? Are they important for the bacterium or are they important for the host? And to determine that, I needed to figure out if they were secreted. Now for the next couple of things I'm gonna talk about, we're actually not doing the work inside of the rhizopus burkholderia system because of the difficulty in working in that system. And we're gonna to move to using heterologous systems to be able to probe apart these, uh, these proteins. So we're returning to our friend Pseudomonas syringi and the model plant Nicoshana bentamiana to do a SIA assay. The way this works is that the catalytic domain of adenylyl cyclase, which we're calling SIA, is tagged onto the end of the protein that you want to see if it's an effector. That protein fusion is then given to Pseudomonas, which is infiltrated into your model plant. And if the SIA is secreted into the plant cell, it's able to convert ATP into cyclic AMP that can be detected by ELISA. So the amount of cyclic AMP you are detecting is an indirect measurement of how much secretion you got of your protein of interest. Our positive control is AVRPTO, and the negative control is a type three secretion system mutant that's no longer able to uh, secrete this just normal pseudomonas effector. Our beetle protein showed the same pattern as AVRPTO and was able to be secreted when the type three secretion system was intact as is evidenced by that blue bar. However, this relied on the first 45 amino acids. If we chopped off the first 45 amino acids, which we had predicted was where the secretion signal was, then you no longer get detectable cyclic AMP, so it doesn't appear that beetle 1913 is being secreted. And if you take that uh, just that for first 45 amino acids and try to tag that onto SIA and look for secretion, you do find uh, detectable cyclic AMP levels. So it appears that the first 45 amino acids are both necessary and sufficient for secretion of beetle 1913. And this was not just an artifact of protein stability. We checked by Western blot that this was, um, that all the proteins were stable and this is really a secretion um, output. Now moving back to our hypothesis slide, we can say that these proteins do transit the type three secretion system, so they're being spit out into the fungal cell. But what are they doing when they're there? Well, they bind to DNA. We are not sure if they go to the nucleus because they did not have a very clear, uh, computationally predictable nuclear localization signal. To test where they go subcellularly, I decided to express them in yeast. So my positive control in this assay is Tal1C, which is the Xanthomonas Tal effector that will nuclear localize that I've tagged with uh, the fluorophore EGFP. So in that top row, the GFP signal is overlapping with the nuke blue DNA stain. And so that indicates that Tal1C is going to the fungal nucleus. This is in contrast to free GFP, which is in the second row, that just kind of floats all around the yeast cell and is not specific to the nuclei. In the third row, I've taken a truncated beetle protein and tagged it with EGFP, and it looks the same as our xanthomonas tal effector in that it does appear to overlap with the DNA stain, and it looks like beetle 1913 is able to nuclear localize. If I mutate an RIRK motif in the C-terminus to alanines, I lost nuclear localization, and it looked more like diffuse EGFP. So I believe that the RIRK motif in the C-terminus is the nuclear localization signal. Now on this slide, I was only using a truncated beetle protein because when I tried to express the full length one, I did not get any fluorescent E cells, which I think means it's toxic. 
This was further verified by the fact that if I tried a nuclear localization signal mutant of the full length protein, so if I did the same alanine mutant in the full length protein, I could get fluorescent yeast cells, but it was diffused throughout the cell. So I think the fact that um, a full length beetle 1913 appeared to be cytotoxic, uh, while an NLS mutant was not, just underscores uh, or just supports our hypothesis that beetle 1913 is functioning in the nucleus. So it makes it to the nucleus, we know it binds DNA, but what's it doing once it get there? How is it directly affecting or is it directly affecting host transcription? To answer this question, we're going back into the plant to do a GUS activity assay, which is pretty common for tau effectors to see uh, if promoters are upregulated by tau effectors. And in this case, we're taking a minimal promoter and putting that in front of our GUS gene that will measure the activity of as a indicator of whether or not our tau effector is upregulating GUS expression. The minimal promoter has an ABRBS3 binding element, um, which is actually a tau effector that naturally targets this promoter, and that serves as a positive control that both of our constructs are working, because we're going to have two constructs, one of which has the beetle 1913 binding element, and one of which has a scrambled binding element um, that should not be bound by beetle 1913. So if it's an activator, you'd expect, expect only the top construct to uh, go up, and the other one should just stay flat. I also included a positive control of a designer tau effector, DT1913, which as the name suggests, is just a mimic of beetle 1913, but in kind of a xanthomonas tau format. So this gives us an idea of what would happen if a xanthomonas tau effector was targeting the same binding element. When I looked at the relative GUS activity, all of my controls acted normally, including a negative control of tau 1C that does not target this uh, promoter in any way. But unfortunately, beetle 1913 looked more like our negative control than anything else, and it did not appear that it was able to upregulate GUS activity in planta. This was not entirely unsurprising as it did not have an activation domain. So I then moved to the hypothesis that beetle 1913 is a repressor instead of an activator. To test that, I just picked one way of being a repressor, although there are a lot of different options. And I was just going to look at binding competition. So that could be nearby, uh, where I co-express ABRBS3 and beetle1913 that have close but not overlapping binding elements, or where I co-express beetle1913 and DT1913 that are in direct competition for the same binding element. Again, I did not see any support for the idea that beetle 1913 was affecting GUS activity. It did not appear to downregulate GUS activity in planta in this assay as well. So that left me with a big old question mark for um, how the host transcription was even being affected by beetle 1913 and what it's doing once it gets into the nucleus and binds DNA. And this will have to be the subject of future study. Um, and we're still kind of leaving it as is right now. So what are they doing? It does look like they are effectors, but what impact do they have on the host of the symbiosis? And to answer that, we need to look in the native system. And we need to move into phenotyping and looking at transcriptome analysis. So we find that um, when we made a beetle 1913 mutant, it seemed pretty fine. So we were able to make a mutant, it grew fine. It was able to still infect the fungus. And fungi infected with wild type or mutant bacterium were still able to grow well on nutrient rich media. They were still able to sporulate equivalently, both asexually as well as mate and form sexual spores. So I moved into trying to stress the fungus out to see if I could get at something that would show me a phenotype. And I plated fungi infected with wild type or mutant bacteria on nutrient poor media, media with salt stress and media with oxidative stress to look for any kind of difference in growth, but still did not find any. However, when I plated fungi infected with the beetle 1913 mutant on media amended with sodium dodecyl sulfate, or SDS, I did find a reduction in growth. SDS is a detergent that causes cell membrane stress, so it appears that the beetle 1913 mutant increased the host susceptibility to SDS. This is a macroscopic phenotype, and I wanted to get at the molecular underpinnings of it by looking to see if there were any kinds of transcriptional or gene expression changes that would let us understand what was going on to cause this difference in growth. 
However, when I did RNA-seq on wild-type mutant and complement infected rhizopus, um, I only found 15 genes that were shared as either up or down regulated in the wild type and the complement versus the mutant. And when I looked at the gene description of those genes, I found a lot of hypotheticals and unknown functions. I also found that most of them had predicted binding elements for butyl 1913. So none of this really gave me an obvious target or mechanism for how butyl 1913 was causing this difference in growth. And this is just kind of a lesson in that your RNA-seq is pretty much as useful as the functional gene annotation of the organism you're working in. Now, all of the work so far had been done just focusing on beetle 1913 and strain B13, but we were also thinking a bit broader, and I wanted to know if uh, what we had found in this system would apply to other uh, strains and species of rhizopus associated Burkleidaria as well. So we did a global analysis of rhizopus associated Burkleidaria strains and uh, looked to see if they had beetle genes by southern blot. So black bands in this blot on the right are indicating that there are beetle genes present across rhizopus associated Burkleidaria strains, although they vary in number as well as probably genomic context by the fact that the bands are kind of all over the place. Thinking ahead to whether or not beetle genes were serving the same role in the symbiosis or whether they differentiated in function, I decided to take one of the beetle genes that we knew the sequence of and clone it out from bacterial strain B14 and see if I could rescue my beetle 1913 mutant phenotype uh, with this beetle 1814 gene. So taking one from a different strain, putting it into the mutant of my strain and seeing if that does anything um, in terms of the phenotype I was seeing, and it did not. So it's not exactly unexpected that um, a different beetle from a different strain did not rescue my beetle mutant because the RVD sequences of these talic proteins do look different, so they are likely binding different DNA. So the conclusions from this part are that despite the cryptic nature or lack of typical tau domains, our evidence supports the hypothesis that beetle proteins are secreted, nuclear localizing effectors that impact the host fungus. And this is the first characterized effector from this symbiosis and the first tau-like protein that is targeting a fungal host. Beetle 1913 does affect rhizopus microspores in some way that makes it less susceptible to SDS exposure, a cell membrane stress, although we don't really know the biological relevance of that at this point. And there's a lot to discover about the functional diversity of beetle proteins as beetle 1814 can't rescue beetle 1913. So the questions remaining are vast, but include what is the effect of SDS stress or cell membrane stress on fungi and how does that affect the partnership? Is this actually something about how the fungus is interacting with its environment that is a benefit the bacterium is conferring? Or is it something about how the bacterium is restructuring the fungus to make it a better home for the bacterium? What's the actual target of beetle 1913 and how does it cause transcriptional changes? Is it relying on endogenous host proteins that were not present in the assays we tested or other effector proteins? Or is it working by some repression mechanism that we have not tested yet? What does this tell us about tau effector evolution or effector evolution in general and how um, bacteria that live inside of different kinds of hosts and in different kinds of interactions uh, use the same types of effectors, but possibly in different ways? And then do beetles within our cross strains have different functions? Um, have they diversified in what they're doing within the symbiosis? Or do they act as host specificity factors and it's just that they're targeting polymorphic sites in the fungal genome? So I'm done telling you all of my stories and I just wanted to bring you back to the title of my thesis, uh, which again was translating lessons from effector biology to all of these different subjects. And Bringing it back to what I was able to do with fungal effector screens, I was able to use bacterial delivery to probe the role of individual effectors. I was able to take a look at plant resistance mechanisms that we already knew about in model systems, but then identify engineerable disease resistance mechanisms in crop plants. And finally, taking what we know about tau effectors from plant pathogenic fungi or uh, bacteria, I was able to look at bacteria that interact with a fungal host and learn about how they can manipulate their fungal hosts and about effector evolution. 
So with that, I'd like to acknowledge um, that the Fungal Effector Project and Barley Project were largely done in collaboration with Roger Ennis and Roger Wise's labs. I've had two amazing, amazing undergraduate uh, assistants on that project that were both um, authors on that Barley MPMI paper. And Matt Helm was an excellent co-first author and he's continuing the decoy engineering work during his postdoc. So I highly recommend you check out his work and follow him if you're interested in that. The Beetle project was done largely in-house here at Cornell uh, with a lot of help from different people from Teresa and Adam's lab uh, based on their various expertise. Uh, formal acknowledgements of funding. I especially wanted to note that I was on a USDA pre-doc fellowship uh, for this last chapter, which allowed me to be a lot more independent um, and was a great uh, excuse to do a whole grant while I was still in grad school. So I highly recommend that to any students who are near candidacy. The deadline this year is in August. I also wanted to thank um, the University of Minnesota for the Barley NAM population prior to publication, as well as a variety of people at Cornell um, who helped with a lot of guidance and resources and all kinds of things. And just quickly, um, I have been really blessed with my time here at Cornell to have had to be an awesome launching point from being involved in just the community here through the Chili Cook-Off and the GSA to uh, getting to go to conferences like MPMI and APS and AAAS uh, with friends and colleagues and being able to network and share my research and learn. I've also gotten really involved in science policy through a lot of support from Cornell and um, APS. And I was thankful to get to go to India with the Cornell Alliance for Science. So Cornell has been a phenomenal place full of opportunities for me. Um, I have to thank my lab. And um, if I could go back and do it all again, I would pick the Bogdanov lab 100 times out of 100 because it's like a lovely group of very supportive, fun, uh, smart, fascinating people. It's been an awesome international community to hang out with and meet people from all over. Um, and I just have really appreciated their uplifting spirits and humor over the years, as well as all the amazing food and um, our silly coffee breaks and things. I'm also very chatty and tend to need people to talk to. So I was very blessed to come in with a wonderfully amazing cohort, um, especially the women I came in with who really supported each other and built each other up through all of this. And they're all in awesome places now. And I um, really appreciate their support throughout the process, as well as uh, tons of conference friends, lab mates and um, game night buds. So it's just been a wild ride and I've met an amazing community of people. I have to especially thank my husband. He will be defending his PhD in physics, uh, becoming Dr. Alex Mani this summer. And um, doing grad school with another person adds difficulty, but it also makes it a lot easier. And I'm so thankful for all of his support, especially in that he has listened to me give this talk about 20 times because we're stuck working at home with side-by-side -side desks. So um, special shout out to him. So with that, I will take any questions and I wanted to thank everyone who joined this virtual seminar and help make it special. It was so fun to watch everybody's names pop up at the beginning. Um, so you can ask questions in the chat or if you go to the participants menu, there's an option to kind of raise your hand and we'll try to call on you and make this happen. <laughs> so anybody who wants to unmute themselves and give uh, <clears throat> join me in um... Congratulating Morgan and thank you for a great talk. Please do so. Absolutely amazing. Great job, Morgan. So Morgan and I have agreed that she will um, moderate. She'll field the questions with this format. It's probably gonna be easier, easy enough for her just to see who's raising a hand. I see John has his hand up. Morgan, you can start there. Um, yeah. Well, let's start with John. Hi, Morgan. That, that was terrific. Um, uh, I do have a question, though, about the uh, competition experiment. I mean, I think the pursuing just how Beetle 1913 does its thing and influences um, the genome is, is fascinating. Um, you're, you did a, a, a pretty stringent test for a competition where you asked Beetle 1913 to compete with another tal effector. And I'm wondering, do you know what the relative uh, binding constants are for those two different tal effectors for the target? And, and is, was it, a, uh, I know, a fair test? <laughs> yeah, 
That's a good question. Um, I do not know if it was a fair test. I, we did find the, I think the binding constant for the beetle protein when we um, were initially just seeing if it would bind that element before we introduced it into our assay. But uh, we did not test the affinity of the designer talofector. So it's possible that the designer talofector was just a better binder and was out competing. Uh, and it wasn't really dependent on activation at that point. <laughs> Yeah, so so I mean, I, th I think it, you could still think about it interfering with uh, functions of other DNA binding proteins, uh, and 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 it's still that that mechanism could still be um, um, viable and, and probably very interesting if it turns out to be so. It, but it could, you could also envision that it <clears throat> that although it has no activation domain, um, none, doesn't have the standard tau activation domain. It could still possibly be acting po positively if, for instance, it were helping opening opening up nucleosomes, uh, opening well, yeah, opening chromatin or opening DNA in general, and, and facilitating other factors to bind. And I'm wondering if uh, uh, if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, I think these are all good points, and it just shows the limits of what we tested in terms of activation and repression because we were kind of focused on our hypotheses being grounded in whether or not this was acting like a tal effector. So we were mm -hmm. testing to see if this kind of does the same things as tal effectors. And after that, it's a much bigger question about what it's doing if it's not doing that. Right. So it, it looks like it's not doing exactly what a tal effector does in a plant. But after that, yeah, it could still be an activator. It has kind of acidic patches on its outside. Who knows if those are interacting with um, host proteins that we just aren't, that weren't present in what we were doing. So I think it's a really cool area that could be a whole nother paper is just figuring out what it's doing once it binds DNA. Yeah. Um, so the next question I saw was from Alvaro. Hi, Morgan. Uh, awesome presentation. Really like an insane amount of work. <laughs> Thank you. So. I do have to ask about the precisely following up on the function. I guess you've seen the preprint, the recent preprint by Richter et al, where they suggest a function for these tal effectors in protecting the bacteria from fungal entrapment. Uh, what do you think about the hypothesis? That is there any discrepancies with your work in theirs? Yeah, so Alvaro is discussing the fact that uh, a preprint was posted about three weeks after ours that um, was using a different strain of bacteria that are in a rhizopus, and they did their own beetle mutant and um, found a phenotype where it was uh, inhibiting sporulation of the fungus and that um, beetles were important for basically establishment of the symbiosis. Uh, we've thoroughly verified our mutants and we did not see the same phenotype. So if theirs uh, is verified, then it must be that they're doing different things in different strains. We have not really investigated that strain um, in terms of making a mutant, but it is a very difficult system to work in. So I think uh, we all have to be careful with what we're, what we're seeing and um, whether things are replicable and um, can complement. So that's what we focus a lot on in our study. Uh, so I'll be interested to see how much their stuff complements, but they have incredibly amazing micrograph images in that paper that I uh, swoon over. So I am really excited to see what comes out of their work as they keep uh, focusing on this. Um, okay, so the next question I saw was uh, from uh, Matthew Willman. Hi, Morgan. You did a really awesome job. I have a question about your barley project. Mm -hmm. um, it looked like you said you had two versions of the barley PBS1, and you had your interact your co-IP experiment with PBR1. It looked like both of your PBS1s were highly expressed in your were highly present in your experiment, but it looked like one was more highly interacting with PBR1 in, mm -hmm. the, in the gel that you showed anyway. Um, do you always see that? And you can, can you, do you have a prediction for why one was interacting more than the other? 
based uh, on sequence I'm not differences to think or back, anything? Back to all of uh, Matt's blots. Um, I think that was a common thing that we saw, but it wasn't entirely consistent uh, because phylogenetically, one of these uh, barley PBS ones is closer related than the um, other one to the Arabidopsis PBS one. It could be that like how they're associating is slightly dependent on some kind of sequence variation that we weren't really focused on because we were looking at the ABR PPHV part. And we do know that certain parts of like PBS1 are involved in interaction with Arabidopsis RPS5, but we don't know as much about what's involved in the PBR1 interaction. So I think that um, that's one of the things that Matt is uh, following up on in his postdoc work is looking into what, um, more about how PBR1 and PBS1 can interact and which domains are involved in that and, and the specificity. Cool, thank you. Yeah, so the next question I actually saw was on the chat and this was from um, Marina and she asked if we know how beetle goes inside the nucleus and if it's possible it's using fungal proteins to be imported into the nucleus and whether or not we've done any co-IP with fungal proteins. So I uh, have not done any co-IP or anything um, in the native system with beetle proteins and trying to pull them out and look about what's coming with them in terms of protein interaction or DNA interaction. I think that's a really interesting avenue to go down in the future, but we cannot overexpress these proteins in um, the natural fungus rhizopus because you can't really transform rhizopus right now. So uh, that's something that could be done in, in yeast potentially to try to look for interactors. Um, I don't personally know exactly the nuclear import pathway anymore. That I think I've learned that at one point. Um, but I do know that the beetle nuclear localization signal, while very cryptic and doesn't really correspond to, like, and it isn't often computationally predicted, it does resemble like a small part of what some of the tau effector nuclear uh, import signals look like. So I think it's probably the same as how tau effectors get into plants and kind of just your, your average nuclear import uh, system. Um, so the next question is from Dan. Well, let's, let's limit it to the next two. I don't think there are any more after that, but you yes, need a break before good. you start the second part of your defense. And people okay, sorry. Again, I'll so. just keep talking. Um, so let's, uh, yeah, so Daniel was the next question. Hey, Morgan, this is Dan Sweeney. Uh, really nice job. Um, I had a question about the barley, not surprising. Um, so my molecular plant pathology is a little bit rusty, but thinking practically about how you would um, potentially engineer resistance to suites of pathogens, um, do you think it would mostly be limited to biotropes with this system since you would be inducing a hypersensitive response or could it potentially be a little more broad than that? Um, my gut reaction says probably limiting to biotropes, but um... It, I guess it just depends a lot on, I mean, yeah, probably not your, your average necrotroph that's just coming in and trying to blast everything, but um, I think it'll be interesting to see which biotropes we want to limit it to as well, because we want to focus on ones that the proteases are rather important, because you don't really want to put in all the work to make a plant that you've engineered um, that then the pathogen can just drop the protease super easily. So I think that's where this research has to go next and figuring out like what the best way to deploy it is and that's why there's been a lot of focus on viruses because the proteases and viruses are so critical to their lifestyle that it would be hard for them to just drop that or change what they target uh, okay and then uh bill's the last question cool hey morgan um super super great presentation Mine is sort of uh, in that same vein of, of barley topics as well, and on the powdery mildew side, probably not surprisingly. Um, as kind of a being on the front lines of, you know, thinking about effectors and obligate biotropic pathogens such as powdery mildews, um, from your experiences, do you think we're still a ways away from being able to look for like putative forms of resistance from like the effector perspective in the fungus and largely have to focus kind of from the host and looking for resistance genes in the host, um, which it seems like, you know, you took that route. Um, but I'm just kind of curious about bigger picture where you think that field stands for obligate biotrophs going forward. Yeah, so one of the reasons we actually got into this is because the, the effector we were 
using and looking at the most um, with trying to develop the, the screens with the bacteria was a protease from powdery mildew. Um, it's BEC1019. Anyway, so that protein, um, and the idea was like, well, if you can figure out what this protease is targeting, especially because it seemed like that protease was very conserved across a lot of plant pathogenic fungi, that maybe it could be a way to take like actual powdery mildew effector biology and apply it uh, into plant, like engineering plant resistance instead of just looking for resistance genes that already occur. So I think we're, we're, we're on the cusp of being able to make that happen, especially as there are better ways to characterize uh, effectors from like mildews and rust because that's been just such a pipeline backlog right now. Um, and I think, unfortunately, the reason that I didn't follow up on that as much is because by the time we got that screen sorted out, I, it was just, uh, you know, you could screen infinite uh, lines of barley looking for, you know, different resistances across. So it's, it's a lot of work and it's a really good thing to like start on a project early on is doing a big, just, you know, fishing expedition for what resistance can we find that's already um, interacting with barley. But I ended up focusing more on like, well, how can we engineer a plant based on what we know about like a barley protease or a, a, a powdered mildew protease. So that was, I was kind of in the middle ground of that, I guess. <laughs> okay, that's it. Thanks again, everybody, uh, especially as you sort of uh, uh, bore with us and we're trying to figure out the ins and outs of hosting a seminar with, with Zoom. We got a little bit of a late start because of that. And I appreciate everybody uh, staying on to the very end here. And thanks again, Morgan. Take a little break. We'll see you in a few minutes with your committee. Okay, thank you everybody. <laughs>